Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome to the English Subject Admissions webinar um, being put on um, by Downing College. Um, we're really looking forward um, to having you here today and having a chat with you about um, English at Cambridge. So why are we running this webinar? Um, so hopefully you're all interested in studying English and studying English at Cambridge. Um, so my name is Katrina um, and I am the School Liaison Officer for Downing College. And my role is to um, help students um, to think about their future and whether they would like um, to come to Cambridge or not. And hopefully um, in a few years time, you will join, some of you will be joining us. So the timetable for today then, I'm going to talk you through um, the admissions process to start with. Then I'm going to hand over to Dr Sarah Kennedy, who's going to talk to you um, about the English course at Cambridge, and give you a course overview and what we're looking for in um, an English applicant. And then finally I'm going to hand over to Rosie, who is one of our current English students, um, and she's going to talk about student life at Downing at Cambridge and in the English department. So a few things to remember, um, if you can keep your cameras and microphones off um, throughout the talks um, and if you have any questions you should see at the bottom of your screen um, a Q&A box so you can type um, any questions you have in there to the panellists and we will either type our answers to you um, or we will answer them live at the Q&A at the end and any answered questions that have been typed if you click back on the Q&A box there's a box that says answered and you'll be able to see them as well as other questions um, that people might have asked that have been answered um, by typing. Um, so yeah let us know if you've got any questions and we'll try and answer as many as we can and um, so you can be entering your questions um, throughout the talks and we'll do all of the questions at the end. Can you all also see a button that says raise hand? Um, if you can see it, um, can you all press the raise hand button for me? Brilliant. So that just helps me um, to know that you're all there and that I can see you all now. Um, so that's wonderful. So what is Downing College then? We're one of the 31 um, Cambridge colleges um, and this is an um, aerial shot of our site here in central Cambridge. Um, so hopefully after um, after the pandemic, some of you might be able to come and actually visit us in person. And we were founded in 1800 and we were 17th college um, to be founded um, as part of the University of Cambridge. We have around 450 undergraduate students um, and about 120 new students join us each year. Um, and we take students for all subjects, including um, English. So the admissions process then, um, I'm going to talk through you, with you about the admissions process. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to cover the role of the departments and the colleges, the admissions process itself, the um, admissions assessments for English, personal statements and then interviews at the end. So about Cambridge then, um, when, we, when students join Cambridge, um, they're part of the University of Cambridge, they're part of the department, in this case English, and they're part of a college, and in um, Rosie's case Downing, or one of the other um, 31 colleges that we have. Um, but what actually do we mean by all these different terms, and which, um, you know, which unit is responsible for what? So I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. So the department, so the English department, sets the course content. So whatever college um, you're part of, the course content uh, for the English course, you will do the same. The lectures, seminars, practicals and projects are set by the English department and are available to all students, um, no matter what college they're part of. All the English students at Cambridge set, sit the same assessments and exams as well, based on obviously the modules that they've chosen, um, but then they just all take the same ones. Then the university, um, they award the degrees. So your degree comes from the University of Cambridge rather than Downing College or one of the other colleges. And the careers advice service is available for all students, no matter of what subject they're studying or what college they are part of. So that's the university and the departments then and what they are responsible for. I guess the main thing I want you to take away is that no matter what college you're studying English at, you're going to get the same um, course and the same degree at the end of it. But the colleges then, Cambridge is a collegiate um, university and so the colleges um, do the um, admissions process which is why I'm talking to you about the admissions process. 
Um, so we select and admit students on behalf of the English department and the other departments um, that we offer. And then when students come um, to the university and come to their college, um, they get pastoral and academic support from the college. So the director of studies um, is within the college and somebody they can talk to about the course. Personal tutor, um, who's there for any um, kind of um, welfare needs and you can chat to them um, about anything um, that's going on that you're unhappy with or want to ask about. And there's also the college nurse and the college chaplain as well for your welfare. The college provides um, student accommodation and um, so the majority of students all live um, in the college and Downing houses all of its students within those college grounds you saw before. And um, there's also dining facilities within the colleges um, and kind of recreational and sports facilities as well. Now the only part of teaching that you do within your college that is not by the department is something called um, supervisions and these are small group teaching sessions and Sarah and Rosie can tell you a little bit more about those um, later on. But what it is is you meet um, with an academic from English and you talk about the um, course and they'll ask you different questions, they might set you some essays or um, kind of homework tasks. Um, and you meet with them um, roughly once a week, um, but it depends on the year and the subject, um, and chat through the course. And this is a really great opportunity, which is very unique um, to Cambridge and Oxford, having this opportunity to talk with people who are experts in their field um, about a subject that you're really passionate about. So the application process then, first of all, you need to choose your course and hopefully you're all interested um, in English and hopefully at the end of this, you're still interested in doing English. You then have to choose your college. So you can choose um, any of the 31 colleges um, except for a few. So um, two of them are postgraduate colleges. So you cannot apply to them if it's your first degree you're doing. And a few of them are women only colleges as well. So do make sure um, whether that applies to you or not. Um, otherwise you do have freedom to choose um, between the others. And if you're really unsure which college um, you'd like to apply for, then you can do an open application um, and you'll be randomly allocated um, to a college who will then do the rest of your application um, and admissions process. You then need to check the admissions um, assessment tests um, and register online and make sure you don't miss um, the deadline for that. Um, and you need to sit the ELAT test um, for English. Then the UCAS application, um, as for Cambridge we ask for the early entry deadline which is the 15th of October. So you'll need to send in your UCAS application um, and that will be with your personal statement, your teacher reference, um, your predicted grades and, um, and other information as such. Then Cambridge, we asked you to do something called an SAQ. Now, this is nothing to worry about. It's just a questionnaire and because the UCAS form goes to all five of your university choices and at Cambridge, we would like to know more information than the UCAS form allows us to ask. So we ask for that information as part of the SAQ. And this helps us make sure we've got um, the same information about every candidate who's applied. Um, so, for example, um, if you're studying um, A-level history, we might ask you what modules in history you're doing um, and then we can look and make sure we know what you're doing. Then submitting any written work. Um, this doesn't apply um, to English at Downing. We don't ask for any written work, um, but you will have to sit your um, test um, in roughly October, November time in year, of year 13, that is. And then in the first three weeks of December, um, we run the interviews and we'll talk to you a little bit more about the interviews later on. Then in January, on the same day, um, everybody finds out whether they've been accepted um, from the college they applied to, whether they've been accepted from a different college or whether they haven't been successful in their application. So that's an overview of the process. Um, the first three points need to be done um, in year 12, at the end of year 12, and from four onwards that all happens in year 13. So what are we using to assess um, your application through all of those stages? Um, we use everything that we know about you as a candidate. So no part of um, the application process is considered in isolation. We'll look at everything that we have about you and make a holistic judgment on whether we would like to make you an offer or not. 
um, and we're looking for um, your suitability for the course so we're really looking for your academic ability and potential and we're not interested in anything else it really is to do with your academic ability and potential um, and we want to see that you've got a genuine subject um, interest in English so why is it that you want to study English for three years and um, show us that you're passionate about the course um, and we might look for subject requirements um, but we're not interested in your background, your school or any extracurricular activities um, that you've done that are not relevant um, to English. So our standard conditional offer then is an A star and two A's at A level and for IB it's 40 to 42 points with 776 in your higher levels. If you're um, in Scotland or Northern Ireland or Ireland doing different um, qualifications to this and um, do have a look at our website and um, for the conversion of what the um, grades are. So your personal statement then, I said that um, this is part of your UCAS form. Um, for those of you who are unsure, this is 4,000 characters, um, including any blank spaces or 47 lines of text, whichever one um, you hit first. Um, to give you a guide, it's about 500, 600 words. It's roughly um, a page of A4 typed um, in you know, normal text and normal margins to give you a rough idea. Um, and why, what it is, is it's a chance for you to tell universities um, why you want to read that subject and why they should choose you and why you'd be good at it. Um, for universities that don't interview, this is really, really important because your only opportunity um, to tell them why they should choose you. Obviously, we do interview, um, but we still want to see that passion um, coming across for the subject. And we would expect it to be um, mainly academic focused, showing the academic ability and potential coming through and why you're suitable um, for the course. Um, so I said before that we're not interested in extracurricular um, activities um, that are not relevant um, to English. What we are interested in is something called supercurricular activities. So you may or may not have heard of these before. There's a few examples um, up here on the board. Um, so these are things that um, you can do. So it used to be called reading around the subject. So supercurricular is anything that you um, do to show interest in an academic subject outside of the classroom. Um, so reading journal articles, reading different books, um, watching kind of TED talks on particular issues that are related to English, anything that's kind of related to the subject um, is a really good um, idea and will really help you your application. So um, it'd be good to get into the habit of doing supercurricular activities. So successful personal statements are ones that give us specific evidence and examples of areas of your interest and achievement, showing that you've gone beyond, beyond your school curriculum and showing real interest in your subject. We'd expect it to be two-thirds um, subject-based, as I said before, um, and it's basically your opportunity to say why you want to study it for three years. And if you can write a really good personal statement, then it's going to help you to know that you're making the right decision. So admissions assessments then. <clears throat> Many of the courses um, require you to sit a test. For English, you're required to sit the ELAP test. Um, this happens before interviews. There's a pre-admissions assessment test. Um, and you need to sit at an assessment centre. Often this assessment centre will be your school. Um, but you need to check with your school um, if this is the case. Um, so do make sure when you can go back to school that you do check um, where your assessment centre will be. Um, and you can't register for these yourself, you need to get the school to register you for them. So make sure you know the right person um, to talk to within school. Now the tests aren't pass-fail, there isn't sort of a pass mark and we won't look at any that get below that. Um, what we're interested in is um, seeing um, how you write and what you've put um, and we'll look at every um, test paper. And what we're testing is how you think, um, so showing the, um, how you think and applying existing knowledge to a new situation, um, which is also what the interviews do. Um, and there are practice papers and specifications available online. So the interview process then, as I said before, these happen in the first three weeks of December. And your interview is going to be conducted by the college that you apply for or the college that you're allocated to if you apply um, for open entry. 
and you will have two interviews, roughly 20, 30 minutes each, and you'll be interviewed um, by um, academics. So um, they could be from the college you applied for and then other colleges and various other people um, to assess you on whether they think um, you should be given an offer. And they are going to be predominantly academic and subject focused. Um, they might ask you a question if there was something interesting on your personal statement um, that they would like to uh, find out more about. Um, but mostly they'll be um, asking you um, academic questions and seeing how you apply that existing knowledge to a new situation. So what you can expect um, interview discussions to involve, potentially recent academic work that has come out, um, any wider readings that you've done around the subject they might ask you about, any work experience and um, if it's relevant, um, any kind of issues going on in the world at the moment um, and how your subject um, relates to those, or any new, new um, kind of news coming up in your subject. Um, they might present you with a new scenario and ask um, what you should do in that situation, or you might be given um, some pre-reading material um, to read through before the interview and then go into the interview um, to discuss. So there's a few things um, to think of there. Um, but it really is a discussion, that's the main thing, is they want to know why you're passionate about the course and showing that passion. So a couple of frequently asked questions then, um, we get asked about gap years. Um, gap years are fine, you can apply for deferred entry, um, we don't mind for English, um, but it is worth um, double checking with the college you apply to if you don't apply to Downing. And then if you have any extenuating circumstances, anything that has um, disrupted your education, um, on your SAQ form you are able to um, say if tell us about that. Um, if you're really unsure whether it counts, um, just put it down because it's better for us to know um, and take this into account when we're reading your application um, than not. And that's everything from me. So I'm going to hand over now um, to Dr Sarah Kennedy and she's going to talk to you about the English course at Downing. Okay, so um, a bit about me very quickly. Um, I am the Director of Studies for English at Downing, which means that in addition to being a fellow in English and doing my own research, I also am responsible for the academic welfare of uh, students within the college. So on average, I would meet with students uh, right, right across the three years in the college uh, to uh, go over their their sort of feelings about the course, their progress, to arrange teaching and that kind of thing. And I do that at the beginning and the end um, of every term. So I'm going to start by just giving a bit of an overview of the way that the English course works. Um, and as uh, Katrina said, this is true of uh, the university as a whole, as well as specifically at Downing. So the course is structured, we call it the English tripos, which simply means the English course, you can think of it as, as you know, tri three, it's three years. Uh, at undergraduate level, uh, it is a three year course. And as of this year, when we've actually slightly altered the structure of the course, it's going to be structured, as you can see there on this slide, first year is going to be called part 1A, second year is part 1B, and then we have part 2. So the, the kind of governing ideas, the way we think about what we are trying to do in structuring the English course at Cambridge, which is uh, you know, reasonably different from English courses at other institutions, is um, across these, what is it, five features I think I've come up with here. So the first of them would be to say that it is supposed to be um, a course that offers you horizontal historical breadth. So the course runs uh, in almost all cases from 1300, so around the time of Chaucer, to the present. Now you can do some study of earlier periods if you want to, but this is quite a specialist thing to do, so I'll come to that a bit later on. But generally speaking, what we want is students to be able to have a, a great arc, a sort of survey of literature written in English from 1300 to the present, so that you can contextualise things um, across time and see how they, they might relate across the historical period, so trans-historically. The next thing that we try and do, and it's a sort of, you know, x-axis, y-axis idea, is to make it um, vertical. So we want to give you um, a sense of depth, we want to get beneath the surface of things um, and allow you to focus very uh, precisely and in great detail on particular periods. So particularly uh, in your third year in part two, you will get the chance to uh, take papers that focus very specifically on maybe even a 10 or 15 year historical period or thematically on a particular um, term or idea. 
Thirdly, we like to think that it is quite flexible in that it gives you the opportunity to pursue your individual interests um, and, uh, you know, to sort of sculpt the course to your own um, specific interests while still making sure you have that sense of breadth. Fourthly, it's historical, and this is quite important, I think, in that we don't want you to think of the text as being entirely without context, as existing only by itself. We want you to be able to think about um, texts and authors as, if not products of their historical moment or their geographical or cultural moment, at least as in dialogue with those contexts. So what we want you to be doing is being able to situate, um, and the course tries to, to, to help you do that, authors and texts within their contexts. And finally, there's a very great fo focus on formal analysis and the understanding of the formal features of texts, their shape, their rhythm, and their texture. And now some of you might've heard of the idea of the Cambridge School of English, uh, which obviously comes out of the University of Cambridge. This was a historical um, critical school of literary studies round about the mid, to, uh, the early to mid 20th century that featured figures like uh, Downing's own F.R. Levis, uh, which had a real formalist approach. So it was very interested in the structure, the scansion, that kind of thing within texts. Um, and we haven't entirely moved away from that. This is still a, a very strong element of the educational culture of the English faculty in Cambridge, that we do like formal analysis. Um, so we hope that we can still offer that to our students. So in terms of the course scope, we try and embrace all the literature written in the English language, which means that you can study literature from, um, you know, from across the world, global literatures, as long as it was written in English rather than having been translated into English. So that means that we're not a comparative literature course that studies literature in different languages or literatures in translation. So it's quite broad. It's not just English or British literature, but it is, uh, not comparative in the sort of strictly uh, international sense. Secondly, the literature that we study, we, we interpret that quite broadly. It means that we might be talking about poetry or fiction, but we also might be talking about other genres such as letters, memoir, criticism, drama and film. So, so imagining literature is quite a broad kind of concept. In parts 1a and 1b, we do tend to focus on literary texts. So for example, if you were writing a research project or dissertation, you might be able to uh, think about film adaptations of um, a, a text, but the primary would be on the original literary text. But later on in part two, things really do open up and you can do entire modules on, uh, on film or on opera or on visual arts. And then finally, coming back to something I hinted at earlier, uh, if you do meet certain prerequisites and you're very interested in studying either early periods or uh, literature in other languages, you can actually borrow papers from other courses such as Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic from classics, or as is quite popular from uh, modern and medieval languages. So you might choose to do a paper in uh, French literature, for example, uh, but that tends to occur in part uh, 1b and part two. So the next thing I want to do is just sort of run through the structure of the, um, the course for each of the three years. Um, now this is, uh, broadly speaking, uh, consistent across the colleges. The precise order in which you do things might vary slightly, so I'll try and mark the moments where there's, there's a sort of greater choice as between colleges. What I've got here is very much the overview of what happens at Downing. So in first year, you would take uh, two compulsory papers. Those would be Shakespeare and what I've called PCCP here, but you may have heard of it as Pratcrit. Um, Pratcrit is the sort of bedrock subject uh, for the Cambridge English course. And that means, um, well, it, it stems from the idea of practical criticism. So a very close attention to textual detail, close reading, focus on the formal features of the texts, as I mentioned earlier. The reason we call it PCCP, which stands for Practical Criticism and Critical Practice now, is that we've tried to broaden that um, close reading uh, discipline to also include dialogue with um, criticism and theory that sort of goes, goes beyond that. So that is almost a, a kind of research methods or um, a disciplinary methods subject that runs right through your course. So you'd be doing it in every single term that you were at university. So you take Shakespeare and, and PCCP. 
You also start work on two of the period papers. That means that the, the papers that are focused on particular historical periods. Now, Downing, you start with the medieval um, and move on to the 18th century later on in first year. At some other colleges, you might only start medieval in second year and you do something else instead. And then finally, um, it, at uh, some point in the Shakespeare term, you would complete a portfolio of essays, which would be um, the substantive assessment for, um, for that year. In second year, so that's part 1b, you take two more period papers. Um, in the case of Downing, that would be the contemporary paper, which is the paper I teach. And then also uh, you'd study the Renaissance. Once you've done that, you choose one of your four period papers to be assessed by dissertation, which is a, an in-depth research project. It's, it's, I think it's between five and 6,000 words. Um, and that is on a topic of your choosing. So you would talk to your director of studies, you talk to your supervisor within the subject uh, that, that you're working on to try and develop a topic that might be sort of reasonably fresh and original or has a very rich vein to be thought through. Um, but substantively, that is something that you get to sort of design and then follow through yourself a little bit like a, I think an EPQ. Uh, and then at the end of this year, this second year, you would sit um, four exams, which would be the three um, period papers plus your Pratt, Pratt Crit or PCCP exam. In part two, you would then take um, two compulsory papers, which is uh, which would be um, practical criticism again, and the tragedy paper, which is a, again a trans-historical paper across tragedy from uh, classical tragedy, so Greek and Roman tragedy, Shakespearean tragedy, um, and Jacobean tragedy more generally, and then also modern tragedy. You write um, one dissertation, which is compulsory, which is five to seven and a half thousand words on, again, whichever topic you want to write on. And then you can choose if you want to, to do a second dissertation um, and take one optional paper or you can do two optional papers. So only doing one, one dissertation in, um, in entirety. And those papers at part two, the optional papers, really are at the point at which you get the greatest scope to, to sort of follow through on your interests. We think by then you've got a really good sense of the scope of English uh, literature, both historically and vertically. And at that point, you, you can really specialise. So this is an example of the kind of uh, course structure you might choose uh, across your three years. Uh, you can see there under first year and second year, the um, the period papers plus the couple of, of um, special topics, the, the um, PCCP and Shakespeare, and of course your dissertation. And then in third year, this person has continued with um, PCCP as they need to and tragedy, which I've somehow left off that list, um, done dissertation, and then they've chosen to study visual culture, which means that they may have, have done uh, work on Hollywood um, film and also the post-colonial paper. So that a, a sort of gives you an, an indication of what you might do. So in terms of how we teach and how you learn, things like lectures and seminars, I think are quite consistent across uh, universities. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a fairly standard feature of tertiary education and teaching. The thing that is really distinct about uh, studying English at Cambridge is the supervision system, which means that we get to talk to you weekly, um, in very small groups. So our standard English cohort at Downing in any given year is, I think, averages around six students. When we're doing supervisions, we would break that down further. And so we might meet uh, two students to one supervisor or in some cases, three students. And in the case of dissertation supervisions, it would be one on one. Um, so it really is a very intensive uh, form of intellectual conversation. And what that means is that we can afford to be very student led uh, in our teaching in the sense that when you're in a conversation, it has a kind of organic shape and, you know, you, you find yourself feeling out the things that, that are of most interest to you in a way that it's simply not possible to be as reactive and responsive um, to, to what a student is interested in and how they think about things in a very large lecture type situation. In terms of the way that you would then learn in that kind of uh, context, then I'd, I'd characterize it as very discursive. Some of you might have heard of the Socratic method, the idea of Socrates asking his um, acolytes questions and getting them to sort of think through their answers. And we very much teach through con conversation and of course, therefore, learning also occurs through conversation. So it's very discursive. I'd call it peer enabled in the sense that you will be in supervisions with 
um, you know, a selection of the same very tight knit group across your three years, um, even where you sort of go out of the college and, and form supervision groups in, in um, across colleges for certain kinds of subjects. Certainly in your first two years, uh, the group stays fairly consistent. So you become a sort of learning community. Uh, you, you talk to one another, you might read one another's essays, you might share one another's video presentations. And it really is, a, it, there is a really lovely sense in which your learning becomes your peers learning as well. Um, in that sense, it's a very active form of learning because you are, and this is, I think, something that's important to think about whether the Cambridge model is the kind of model you want. You are on your metal all the time. You know, there's not really anywhere to hide in a supervision of two students and one supervisor. If you're asked a question, you have to be keen to try and make sense of things in real time, even if you might feel very confused or bewildered. But I think there's something about how active you need to be that really does allow you to uh, move very quickly and uh, gain access to sort of new insights and ideas very quickly. And so I'd say finally that uh, in terms of the way that you learn, we want you to build your own narratives. It's not a case of me being what they call the sage on the stage, uh, transmitting to, to you the accepted settled knowledge I have. It's a case of me maybe sort of helping you, guiding you through laying out the options and saying, how do you make make sense of this how would you describe the development of this particular genre across the 20th century say what kind of framework would you construct to make meaning of these texts for yourself okay so what are we looking for uh, in, in an ideal candidate so Catriona has already talked a little bit about uh, the importance of a strong academic record. So I, I don't think I really need to go through that in a great deal more detail. We can obviously answer questions on that uh, if you have more. I suppose that the, the idea of this interest in the subject really is absolutely key. I mean, we want to see students who have not only read what they've been offered, what a high school curriculum says, are the things that you should read because we regard that as a baseline. We'd like to see people who have a genuine kind of intellectual curiosity to read beyond what they've been offered, uh, beyond the periods, the historical periods that might be the most obvious, um, and have demonstrated in various ways their commitment to engaging with the subject. So that might be writing your own poetry, or it might be, um, you know, attending talks if you can, um, and if you have the sort of resources to do that, or it might be watching TED Talks or listening to podcasts, but anything that sort of allows you to really immerse yourself in literary texts, literary contexts, um, and, and sort of communicate that to us. So that the, the independence is really important there, independent study, independent mindedness. In terms of personal qualities, I mean, I, I think I've already suggested this a little bit by talking about curiosity, but uh, I think really this is a challenging course. It's a course that requires you to read a great deal to uh, and at speed to um, turn the experience of reading into a very active one where you're simultaneously thinking about your own responses to a text. And that, I think, requires a kind of intellectual flexibility, an open mindedness to what the text might be offering you or what it might be resisting in you as a reader. Um, and you, you really need to have the ability to sort of bring all of those resources to the intellectual conversation um, and, you know, a desire to be challenged um, both both within conversation and beyond it. So thank you very much for listening. I think that's pretty much all I had to say, but I'm obviously very happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, and I will now pass on uh, to Rosie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, that was really interesting. I hope you all found it um, really useful. Um, we're just gonna hand over to Rosie now. She's gonna talk to you about um, being a student at Downing College, um, how she's found um, moving to Cambridge, how she's found um, studying English, and give you a little bit more insight into that. So we'll give her a chance um, to set up. So I'm Rosie. I'm a first year English student at Downing College. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a bit about um, how I'm finding Cambridge, how I'm finding the English course, what it's like at Downing, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. So Sarah's already talked quite a lot about the structure of the course. 
So I'm not really going to go into the individual breakdown of that, but I do want to talk about how I'm finding the structure of this course. So with the supervisions, the kind of intense supervisors to two or three students, um, I think that there's generally a much more equal balance between the students and the supervisor. You enter into this joint conversation rather than kind of being taught something and learning something. Um, and in doing so, it kind of really helps you to build the confidence to voice your thoughts, um, to talk through and develop your ideas, um, and to change your ideas sometimes because you get the back and forth that is quite rare to find that is so useful in your kind of journey, your academic journey. Um, I think I still find, after almost finishing my first year, these supervisions to be quite a privilege because um, coming from A level, it was so inspiring to get this weekly opportunity to talk to other people who were just as excited and inspired about English um, and to have these conversations with them that I haven't been able, I, that I hadn't experienced elsewhere before. Um, and then I also wanted to quickly talk about lectures. I saw a question about choosing them at the start of the year and how that works. Um, and the official university stance on English lectures is that they're optional but not because they're not important, because they're used alongside your supervisions to help increase your knowledge and your understanding of the course. So um, the way that I've always approached these lectures is the general recommendation is to choose maybe five or six of the series of lectures and a series is maybe four to six lectures delivered by the same lecturer um, that are particularly interesting or inspiring to me relating to the module that we're studying um, and in this sense it's really exciting because you get a greater opportunity to fine-tune the course um, to what interests you the most so it's quite a rare opportunity to expand your knowledge in a way that's exciting and really personal um, so Cambridge worries before applying which everyone has um, for me my main worry was the social aspect of Cambridge. I was so torn on whether Cambridge was the place for me. Um, I was deciding between Cambridge and Sussex, which are completely different universities. And on the one hand, I was so excited by the prospect of getting the best education I could imagine getting on a subject that I really loved. Um, but on the other hand, I was really worried about missing out on the, the university experience. I was worried about meeting the right people and kind of getting a chance to live on my, my own without the Cambridge bubble. But these doubts were all so misfounded. Um, Cambridge is such a massive university and there's so many opportunities to meet people, be it at your college, in your lectures, um, college specific societies or university societies and sports and stuff. So you're, the, the likelihood that you're gonna meet people that are your kind of people is just massive and I guarantee you that so many people who have applied to Cambridge will have had the exact same worries that you're having now about it. Um, I was really lucky I met my best friend at um, Downing on my first day and it just kind of dissuaded all of these doubts I had but for some people it takes time there's so many people there and you're meeting so many new people every day that it's unlikely that you're going to meet people that you immediately click with but that's not to say you won't because if you give it time you will. Um, another thing I was worried about for applying was that you're not allowed to work in term time at Cambridge. You, have, you enter into this contract with the university because it's so intense where you agree not to work for the eight weeks. And I thought this was going to be an issue. But because it's only three terms of eight weeks, you have all of the vacation time to work. And you can also participate in casual work with the colleges and the university, like this seminar. Um, so that was much less of a concern than I thought it might be. And then the final one and the big one is the intensity of Cambridge. Um, it is intense, it's really hard. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit more about this later, but it's important and it's difficult to know just how hard it is when you apply and when you kind of agree to get yourself into this. You do have to work hard, but at no point in my education so far at Cambridge have I felt that working hard comes before me as a person, my mental health or my personal life. 
there's so many facets of support like actually Anna was mentioned um, that you can access like your director of studies your tutor the counseling services that are offered and I promise that all of the people who are teaching you care about you and not your work it's hard yeah but it's also so supportive um, Katrina has also briefly touched on the college system so there's 31 colleges at Cambridge you can apply directly to college or you can submit an open application your college is where you spend most of your time where you live where your other English students within your college um, are so it feels like a really big choice to decide on which college you're going to apply to because there's so much choice that you want to make sure you make the right one um, and there's such a range of factors in deciding which college is for you the size of the college um, the location of the college the appearance whether it has a gym a pool a theatre but the reality is that no matter which college you apply to you'll love it um, I initially applied to Pembroke College um, and I got pooled which is a system that Cambridge has in place that ensures that you're not at a disadvantage depending on which college you've applied to and how many applicants they've got so if the college you've applied to think that you'll be a good student for Cambridge but they personally don't have a space for you you get put into the pool and then all of the other colleges consider the pool and their, their own college applicants before handing out offers. Um, but even though I got pulled and it wasn't the college that I initially um, applied to, I'm so proud to be a member of Dying College. Um, and I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. For me, the best thing about Downing is the community aspect of it. So like Katrina said, um, we're lucky enough to have a campus big enough to house first, second and third years all together within Downing and this is quite rare and it means that you're so much more likely to develop into year relationships as well as just relationships with the people in your year um, and this creates such a nice community feel um, and this is really evident in stuff like on a Thursday we have this thing called Keith's Cafe which is um, our reverend of the college chapel, uh, Keith, he puts a little table stand up at the front of the chapel and he has donuts and he has um, hot drinks and lemonade and it's always crowded and students are packed in to have this free coffee, this free donut and to just have a chat and a catch up and it's such a wonderful thing and it's so nice that every time you go on a Thursday it's always so busy. Um, so it is different, your college is all colleges are different and it's just about finding the right fit for you. So how hard is Cambridge really? Um, it is hard, there is no avoiding that. Um, because of the brutally short terms of Cambridge, they're only eight weeks long like I've mentioned, you have to be prepared to work hard for most days for eight weeks. But that doesn't mean working all day every day. The general kind of recommendation is to try and get into the habit of working nine to five days like you would if you had a job and this way you can get your weekends and your evenings free but obviously the style of working doesn't fit everyone's routine um, and you'll work out what method of working works best for you but it is a good way to consider the amount of work that you'd be expected to complete um, and it doesn't always work either you can plan your time and things happen Cambridge is a hectic place and as the picture on my PowerPoint demonstrates um, poor time management always happens. You'll find yourself in situations where you have to, to work out of the routine that you thought you, you were in, but it's completely doable. You have to work hard, but you definitely get to play hard too. So playing hard, there are societies and sports at both college and university level. So you'll get the chance to meet people from all over the university, not just drawing college. Um, but co the college itself does have its own societies. So the Blake Society is the Humanities Society at Downing, which encompasses English, um, named after Quentin Blake, who's a pretty cool alumni. Um, there are societies from drama to charity work, to cultural societies, to chapel choirs. Um, there's pretty much every sport that you could think of at all levels. Um, the nightlife in Cambridge is pretty questionable. There's three main clubs, but you learn to love them. Um, but a lot of my favourite times at Cambridge come from just chilling with my friends. Um, there's so many lovely places to walk, to go out for food, we have lots of movie nights, we cook together every night. Um, so it's important to bear in mind that you will have so much time to maintain your personal life and do the things that you love. It isn't all just work. 
Um, and this is an example of one of my favourite things to do. Um, so at Cambridge, you'll, you'll develop methods and ways to kind of manage your personal needs with your academic needs. And for me and my friend, we signed up to this website called borrowmydoggy.com and it allows us to, um, we've kind of adopted two dogs that we take for a walk a week, a weekly walk um, called Lulu and Digsy. And we do this every Wednesday and it's just such a wonderful way to get out, experience some greenery, clear our heads, have a chat, um, especially when we miss our own dogs. So, you know, there's so many ways that you can you can have the life that you want to have at Cambridge as well as working really hard. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the more bizarre traditions at Cambridge now, traditions that I found completely bizarre when I first heard about them. Um, so Cambridge formals, um, Cambridge formals happen, well at Downing, Cambridge formals happen three times a week um, on a Wednesday, Friday and a Sunday and they're just a really exciting chance to dress up, you know you've got to go in a formal dress, put on your gown, enjoy a three course meal with your friends um, and just have a laugh and relax a bit in a quite a bizarre situation. This is a picture of our dining hall at Downing by the way. Um, and another really really bizarre Cambridge tradition is um, this thing called college marriage. So in the first year you find someone to be your college husband or wife um, which often includes highly extravagant proposals. So on the left is my friend proposing to me after a treasure hunt around Downing and on the right is me proposing to her again weird that you propose back and forth um, and I hid her ring in the Christmas cracker at our Bridgemas formal um, Bridgemas is when Cambridge celebrates Christmas because we're not there we leave early in December so it's the 25th of November um, all college couples then get allocated college children which are when we're in second year they're the incoming first years um, and there's a family day in Freshers' Week where the college parents and their children spend the day together and get to know each other and Cambridge a bit better. And it sounds so odd, but again, this is another really lovely way uh, to foster inter-year relationships. Um, and finally, key things to remember. It's not as scary as it seems. It feels, when you're contemplating going, as completely unachievable. It often feels really daunting, but it's not. It, it's just a university, it's a really good university, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't be put off applying because of its status. Um, look after yourself, um, like I've been talking about all of the ways to maintain your work-life balance um, is really important and it's so doable. And finally, it'll be worth it. Um, I can remember how hard the application process for English was, it was really time consuming, it was difficult, um, particularly when you're balancing it with starting year 13, but it will be worth it. Give it a go and it will be worth it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, we also had a couple of questions about um, A-level subjects um, to um, take and whether there's any disadvantage having different subjects and what kind of subjects um, we'd like to see together. Um, Sarah, would you like to um, answer that? Um, yes, I'm just sort of trying to read through and see um, what questions are. I think some of them um, I've tried to answer. Um, essentially, I mean, it, it, people are asking whether they'll be disadvantaged by studying any given subject. There's really no disadvantage um, in, in the subjects that you study. I mean, obviously, if you can, um, you know, do well in subjects that are going to be um, strongly applicable to English and I, I gave the examples in one of my answers there um, as you know history, philosophy, sociology, um, you know drama and theatre studies, all of these things are, are sort of self-evidently I think uh, relevant to studying English. Uh, so no I, I wouldn't say that there's any disadvantage. Uh, is there something more specific uh, Katriana that you, you'd like me to answer on that front? No I think I think that, that covers it thank you. Um, we also had a couple of questions um, about dissertations and the kind of flexibility around um, subject. I think you covered it um, a bit, but can you choose your own subject area and topic? Sorry, yes, just, just trying to scroll up to, to where that is. Um, where is this in relation to? 
Uh, the question says, how do dissertations work? Can you choose your own subject? Oh, I see. I see. Dissertations, yeah. Um, yes. So, I mean, I don't, essentially what you're doing is, first of all, choosing what paper you want to um, write your dissertation in. So if, for example, you said, uh, I'm interested in um, doing my research, my dissertation in contemporary lit, um, that paper runs from 1870 to the present. So you'd sit down with me, both because I, I'm your DOS and because I'm the person who teaches that paper and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm really keen to work on, um, you know, it could be anything from within that period. So examples are I've had people work on, um, you know, narrative form in, in Joyce or um, the, the poetry of the Me Too movement. Um, it really can be, um, you know, sort of right across the board. I've had spoken word British Muslim women's poetry as one of one of a uh, dissertation I've um, supervised within that um, within that period paper. So you choose your, your historical period, and then within that, almost anything goes. Um, depending on on the college and the DOS you have, you might find um, some people wish to give more guidance. So they might say, look, you know, I know you're really interested in this topic, but it's you know, it's been really thrashed out before. So have you considered looking at it from this perspective instead? So there can be a little bit of guidance, but generally speaking, you work through the topic um, you know, at, with, with, with your um, advisor. Great, thank you. Um, Rosie, uh, from a student perspective, how did you figure out what specific literature you were interested in, uh, particularly for your personal statement they're asking as well? Um, I mean, I didn't sit down and try to find some literature that I liked. It was kind of just in what we were, what I was reading, certain things would excite me, so I'd want to find more about them. Um, and when I was writing my ELA, that was a really good source for me to kind of investigate what literature I liked, because I chose a question that was related to English. Um, I was looking at Bart's The Death of the Author, and that segued me into loads more texts that I'd never heard or considered before through that exploration. Great, thank you. Um, I've heard a few questions about um, colleges and doing English at a different college. Um, just to say, um, as I did before, that um, you get taught the same course, so you're doing the same English course that Sarah was talking about, that was for all the colleges. It is only your, um, your supervisions um, that are different um, and they just happen within your college um, and that is kind of the only teaching that happens um, within college, so I hope that that clears it up um, for those questions. Could I just slightly jump in on that too, Catriona, just because often people are asking about um, the, the kind of texts that you get set or otherwise. So um, what you will find is that there will often be a particular focus on certain um, almost umbrella texts within a historical period at the faculty. So you would not um, take the Renaissance paper without studying Milton, for example, just everybody is going to study Milton. But um, beyond that, you will find that individual colleges have quite different reading lists. And what supervisors usually try to do is to say, here is a list of X number of um, texts, choose from within those the ones that you would like to work on or focus on most closely. Perfect. Or indeed go beyond the list and say, actually, I want to work on this other thing that you haven't given me the option of, but that should also be fine as well. Great. Um, so I don't know if you um, know the course at Oxford um, at all, um, but we've had a few questions about how it's um, different. Do you, do you know about the course at Oxford? I don't know um, anything about the specifics of the course structure or what is taught, so I really can't speak to that. Um, my general sense is that the you know these institutions are more alike than they are different um so i wouldn't torture yourself about making the choice between them i think it's very much a sort of personal question i mean uh, often the staff at these institutions are people who move between these and and other tertiary institutions so it's not as closed to an intellectual bubble as you might imagine um but you know once this pandemic is over and we can move around a little bit more I would encourage people just to go and walk around and if they can talk to the people that they might be being taught by because that is the best way to get a sense of the kind of culture and the cultural differences between places which um, which is probably the, the main thing that differentiates. Yeah it's worth having a look at the course detail obviously we, we work at Cambridge so we can't speak um, 
for Oxford other than things that we've heard of. Um, so do have a look at the course detail and go for the course um, that you like more, the one that suits, suits you better. That's definitely the right thing to do. Um, so I've got a question here. What's the hardest part about the English application process? Rosie, what did you find the hardest? Obviously it'd be different for each person what they find the hardest, um, but which bit would you say for you? Um, I don't think, for me it wasn't one particular aspect of it, how I do it. Um, writing a personal statement is always really hard because you've got such a small word count to try and get so many kind of ideas that you've got in on paper. Um, so that's always really hard. And it took about six or seven redrafts. It was a really long process. So you need to be willing to put the time in for that. Um, and other than that, I think probably the most stressful thing was the ELAP, just because, you know, it, it's a it's like an examination. You don't know what's coming. You've just got to sit down and face it and you've got 90 minutes or however long it is to do your best and that's always quite daunting. Great. Um, could you also explain what the ELAP is and kind of what goes into that? Um, yeah, so the I think the best way to explain the ELAT is kind of a before Cambridge attempt to practical criticism. Um, so kind of approaching these texts that you won't have considered before um, and analysing them in relation to a certain question. So you're given six passages, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, because it was a while ago. Um, six passages, and then you choose two of them, I think, to discuss in relation to the question. Um, and then you just essentially write an essay on them. Great, thank you. So hopefully um, that clears that up uh, for anyone who was unsure. Um, I also posted um, in the answered questions um, a link um, to the ELAT um, page on the website. Um, if you can't find it, just type ELAT into um, your search engine and um, it's the first link that comes up and it talks more about um, the test and the kind of application process around it. Um, so do have a look at that. Um, I did have a question about um, the the short essays. Um, you're saying you do one or two a week, Rosie. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of constitute as a short essay? Um, the the word count that we've been given varies quite a lot depending on your supervisor. So the essays that I've written have been anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 words. Um, so they're not massively long, but they do take so you have you have to read the primary text that they're based on, and then particularly if they're for one of the literature modules, so like Shakespeare or medieval, you then read quite a lot of critics and what they think and what they say about it, and see how that influences your argument, and then you put together an essay. So although the essay itself isn't very long, it is quite a long process. Great. Um, Sarah, have you got any advice um, for preparing for interviews and um, when they get to it? Yes. So, I mean, the, the most obvious advice is to read over your personal statement because there will be, uh, you know, quite a long period of time lag between when you write it and when you turn up for interview. And, you know, we're reading them as if they are much more current than they really are. So if you can speak not only with some familiarity with the texts that you mention, uh, whether critical or primary, but also give some thought to how your ideas about those texts might have changed over time since you wrote that, um, or, you know, be able to, to situate them in relation to maybe what you're reading now, that would be uh, a really good way of preparing. Um, and then beyond that, I really think it's just a case of immersion. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a pretty tough conversation if we say, <clears throat> you know, tell us about what you've been reading and you say, well, you know, I've kind of not been reading so much lately. That doesn't, you know, that's not going to lead to a really um, rich conversation. So I'd just say read a lot. Um, I've, I've talked before in, in various other places and videos about the idea of triangulating. So if there's a particular author that you really enjoy, you might say, you know, draw a triangle from that text to other texts that the author has written and read those or um, the author's contemporaries or maybe move from uh, the literary text the author has written to reading their unpublished letters or their published letters or whatever else. So just kind of draw drawing a triangle around the thing that's your, your major site of interest and going 
um, you know, out in slightly lateral directions to see if there's a way of, um, you know, compounding that interest that you can then talk about. Great, thank you. And that kind of ties into the supercurricular stuff um, that I was talking about before um, and had a few questions about and um, kind of what resources. Um, if you head to the Oxford and Cambridge Collaborative Outreach Network, sorry, it's quite a long um, title, um, they have some resources on their website and the University of Cambridge Colleges just produced a, a supercurricular um, activities kind of list of resources on their website. Um, I did post a link in the answered questions so do have a look um, for it through there um, and you can scroll down to English and see um, some suggestions there. Um, is there anything else Rosie and Sarah that you would add kind of sort of super curricular anything that you've kind of come across that you think is really good for students? Um, I mean it's probably on the super curricular list I haven't seen it yet but I would definitely not underestimate the uh, benefit of literary journalism in building familiarity with the stuff that um, you know the, the people within that world are talking about and fighting over and worrying about um, and quite often with publications like the London Review of Books, the New Yorker, the Paris Review you will find that they um, offer time limited access but free access online to their archives so they'll, they'll particularly if you follow them on social media there'll be a you know read this particular article from 2015 for the next 24 hours and it's a really good way of going back and revisiting some of their best journalism and then you know if you read a great article about a particular writer you haven't heard of you're more likely to then be able to be, be oriented as a way into that writer so i'd recommend doing that rosie what about you um, I think the main advice I'd say for supercurricular um, kind of reading is don't do it for the sake of doing supercurricular reading. Make sure it's something that you're really excited and interested by because otherwise you're not really going to get as much out of it and, and you won't be able to kind of talk about it with the passion that you need to to show that this kind of stuff excites you. Um, so definitely do it, but make sure it's really interesting stuff, not because you want to like tick off a list of super quick stuff that you've done. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely um, echo what Rosie just said. Um, in terms of personal statements then, um, I've been asked about kind of how many pieces of literature we would um, expect to see. Um, it's more about um, the quality of your personal statements, so rather than a, a list of um, kind of books or literature that you've read, um, what we're looking for is to see um, kind of what you've gained from reading that rather than what you learned from it. Um, that is why um, you would put it in rather than just saying, I finished it but I didn't understand the word it said, sort of. Um, would you agree with that, Sarah? Um, is there a sort of... Sorry, you'll have to... I tuned out for a minute. I was looking at the questions. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I was just saying about personal statements, how it's about um, the kind of um, quality of how their personal statement rather than listing kind of they've read 10 books or whatever, because they've asked how many pieces of literature we would expect to see. Yeah. Do you have a kind of rough number in your head? Obviously, it's more about the quality, but... No, it's, it's, it's really not um, a, a case of it being a sort of, you know, th there's no magic number. Um, and I think also it's probably important to say when we, when we talk about the quality of a personal statement, we're not expecting, you know, beautiful, exquisite, finely wrought prose either. What we want is um, writing that communicates something of who you are as a person, how you think, how, how, what your approach to text is what forms of curiosity you can be studying. Um, maybe that's what all sounds hopelessly abstract, but, um, you know, passion gets discounted a lot these days, perhaps because we talk about it so often that, you know, we get, we get a bit tired of the cliche of saying, oh, I'm really passionate about this. But I think people who do have a real passion for particular texts are able to sort of, to write about how they might've come across the text, how they might've encountered it, how they felt while reading it, how, having read it, they're thinking about it changed once they went on and, and followed up and read something else. So it's that kind of narrative of the way you think about the text, how you encountered it, how your thinking has evolved. That's what we want. Um, and you can't really do that in a personal statement, given the length it is, if you're going to be talking about 20 books. So I think it kind of has a natural limiting factor, given the length. Definitely. Thank you. Um, Rosie, I'm aware that you are only in your first year, um, but they would like to know whether you do have any career plans at this time. 
Um, I have really not thought about kind of life after Cambridge. Um, I'm just enjoying the opportunity to kind of explore literature in kind of so much with so, such a focus and so deeply that I just haven't really wanted to extrapolate it out to the real world. I'm quite happy in this little, little literature bubble right now. Yeah, I think that's completely fine. You are only in your first year after all. <laughs> um, Sarah, do you want to touch on kind of jobs that the English students do kind of go on to do? Yes, well... Uh, Where it's there, all sorts of things, but... Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually a difficult thing to answer, especially at the moment, because um, uh, English is one of those degrees that is um, so... Uh, it is in a sense quite multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary it draws on lots of other disciplines and that means it has a kind of fluidity and flexibility which makes it super applicable across all sorts of jobs um, so anything where you have to have really good language skills communication skills skills at writing skills at analysis um, obviously not sort of data and numerical analysis because we're all um, <laughs> we're all probably a bit behind the curve on that in English, or I certainly am. Um, but anywhere where you actually have to bring a sort of critical eye to the way that language is constructed and the way that meaning might be more ambiguous than it, than it seems is going to be something that English fits you well for. So, I mean, most obviously, and, you know, if you've been searching, studying English, you'll already know all the websites will talk to you about uh, careers in the media, in journalism, um, broadcasting, politics, law, um, you know, and then also in the performing arts um, you know, and, you know, even perhaps in the visual arts, in um, the museum sector, in curation. There are so many areas that you can go into within that kind of central sphere. But equally, I've had students who've, who've branched out. Oh, and of course, education. I should have mentioned education as well. Um, but I've had students who've gone on to work in healthcare, um, you know, as well. So it really is, or even become entrepreneurs. Um, looking at our alumni, it really is quite a varied um, category of people. So I, I, it, it's, I, I don't think you need to worry too much about how broad it, it, it is, because it's going to equip you across a, a great many different possible fields. Um, I'd also say that given, and I need to be careful about how I word this, but given that we are in, in a moment of such enormous social and economic uncertainty, it's almost impossible to say what the job market is going to look like in two years or three years or five years. But whatever it is, it's probably not going to be what it's like now. And at the moment, it's not the, I mean, let's be honest, it's not the happiest picture. So I think it is important to be thinking about what your long-term trajectory is but I think it's also important to think about what serves you best at this moment in your own development in your own interests and English is a subject that allows you to develop as a person and is in terms of your own interests and leaves your options open for what you might want to do later on so I think actually people studying English at the moment are quite well served in terms of this this broader uncertainty and having um, a degree from Cambridge also helps with your well, yeah. job applications because <laughs> um, we have um, one of the highest um, kind of employment rates as well. Um, so that's worth thinking about. Um, next question, quite an easy one. Rosie, how close is down into the English building, faculty building? Um, it's about a 20 minute walk to Sidgwick site, which is where the English faculty is. Um, I mean, I've done it in 10 minutes, but I really needed to. And you can cycle <laughs> it really quickly, but it's a really nice walk. Um, it goes along the river camp. Um, and it's always been one of our favorite parts of our day in the morning, kind of having a chat on the way to lectures. It's a really nice. Cambridge is flat as well, which is, I mean, snow <laughs> big hills first thing in the morning. <laughs> Um, the question here about kind of work experience, I think this is coming from my talk, so they might, might ask you about it. Um, Sarah, is work experience really um, something you're looking at or not really for English? Um, work experience is not going to be, um, a, you know, a sort of a, put you at a positive advantage, put it that way. So if somebody had done work experience that they wanted to talk to us about, um, 
that, and that they thought was relevant. It might be the case that that leads to an interesting conversation, but it, 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 would, it certainly wouldn't be the difference between us saying this is, a, this is an acceptable candidate and this is an unacceptable candidate. I mean, what you, what you do with your time and what you're able to do with your time is gonna vary wildly between different people. So we certainly don't want anybody to feel that they should be put off applying because they didn't get to do work experience or they didn't do the kind of work experience which they think we're, we're looking for. It really, you know, it's, it's nice, but it's not gonna ever determine anything. Great, thank you. Um, I've also got a question here um, about scholarships. Um, do we have any um, kind of scholarships? Obviously, I know about kind of bursaries, um, but do we have any scholarships, Sarah, for English? Um, we don't have scholarships per se, and certainly not anything that's going to cover everything, but we do have the Cambridge bursary system, which I think you could probably speak to in more detail than I can. Um, yes. that, that is across the university, the Cambridge bursary system. In terms of Downing specifically, we do have um, a, a fairly modest book fund, which helps, I think it's it's allocated to all students, which gives you, do you remember how much it is, Rosie? Yeah, um, for English students, I think it's 89 pounds a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we have, you know, prizes um, for creative writing and that sort of thing. But in terms of actual support for, uh, to cover tuition or living expenses, that, that would be a Cambridge bursary scheme. Yeah. So the colleges um, don't want money to um, kind of put you off. So if you if you need some support financially, um, do get in, you know in contact with the colleges um, and also the Cambridge bursary, which is based on your household, your family income, and a bit of extra money there. There's also the student finance um, England scheme. Um, so do have a look at that, and you can kind of calculate roughly um, how much you will be eligible for um, on that as well. Um, so yeah, don't let finance kind of um, put you put you off. Um, um, often people think Cambridge is quite expensive as well, um, but there's um, lots of you know student discounts, all of these things. Um, but you're actually not in Cambridge for that much of the year. Um, so um, huge cost, obviously, is accommodation. Um, but you. Um, most colleges you're only paying sort of 30 weeks rent because um, you move out in the holidays as most um, other universities you'll be paying kind of 40 weeks or if you're in private letting kind of 50, 52 weeks. Um, so there's um, that to, to take into consideration um, as well. Um, Rosie, what is the most rewarding part of your degree? Um. I think it has to come back to what I was saying about the supervisions. It's so rewarding to have people who want to talk about literature exactly the same way that you want to talk about literature. And I can remember um, when I went for my interview, um, it was the first time I'd ever engaged in an academic conversation of that level. And it was just so inspiring. And regardless of the outcome, I was just so pleased that I'd had the opportunity to take part in something quite as exciting as that and so different. Um, so it's definitely just being surrounded by people who are just as passionate and as excited by it all as you. I think it's such a rare situation to find yourself in. Thank you. Um, another one for you, Rosie. Is the workload at Cambridge more than other universities? <laughs> I mean, I'm not at other universities, but from what I've heard, absolutely. You know, quite a lot, me and my friend, when we've got like two essays a week, we're like, we could have just gone somewhere else and not have to do two essays a week. We could have done two essays a month or two essays a term. But it, it's rewarding and it's worth it. So there's a lot more, but because you put a lot more in, you get so much more out as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, and did you do any essay competitions? Would you um, suggest them being helpful as well if, if you did? I never did any. I had a look at them and they all seemed quite difficult. Um, and I didn't have the time. I was focusing on other parts of my application, but I know other people who did do them and if they're the kind of thing that excites you and you've got something exciting to say about it then absolutely do it but again it's the sort of thing that I wouldn't do just for the sake of doing it because you think it's another tick definitely do it if it's something that you think is a valuable use of your time perfect yes yeah, kind of a super curricular activity if that's what you would um, enjoy doing great thank you but having a look at them is quite a good way of kind of considering the, the sort of level of essays that you'll be considering at Cambridge. So although you don't necessarily have to answer them, it's always interesting to have a look and see what the questions are on. Great, thank you. Um, Sarah, 
Do you use the Harkness debate-like method at Cambridge? It's not something I've heard of. Um, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to answer questions at the same time and all this typing is, is clackety clack keyboard. Um, we don't use it um, in any sort of um, deliberate pedagogical way, but it certainly is of a piece with all of that category of um, you know, Harvard style or Harkness debate or, or Socratic method, anything um, that assumes that you will be, I, mean, I suppose that it, it's, it's almost indistinguishable from the kind of critical conversation that both Rosie and I have spoken about. Um, so functionally speaking, yes, we do kind of use that, but as I say, not, not branded as such. Great, thank you. Um... Is there any kind of support or opportunity for creative writing within the course? Uh, absolutely. So um, the course itself doesn't, I mean, there is a prize, I think, for creative writing that, that you can um, submit work to at the faculty level. Um, creative writing is not currently recognised in terms of formal assessment. So you would not be able to substitute creative writing submission for a dissertation, for example, or anything like that. So there is a sort of fairly strict dis delineation between formal academic assessment and creative writing, which is not formally part of the course. But there's certainly opportunities for its recognition, both at the faculty level, as I've said, in terms of that prize and also within the college. And I think Downing is a particularly strong college in this respect. We have a, um, a creative writing competition that we run every year. Um, which involves, I think, some reasonable measure of prize money. I think the first prize is about five hundred pounds, something like that. Um, and the, which is the is the John Traherne Award, I think, which there are details of on the website. But we also, rather more fabulously, have the uh, Festival of New Writing, which, if uh, any of you out there are budding playwrights, is a fantastic festival. Have you had any involvement with it, Rosie? Did you want to speak about it at all, or no? Um, I know I wasn't involved in it. Uh -huh. um, so this is a festival that is put on annually. It uh, involves um, uh, one act plays submitted by students which are reviewed and then uh, three, uh, no, nine plays I think are chosen to be performed for a panel of industry experts as well as a live audience. And um, in previous years we've had uh, Chips uh, Hardy, who is Tom Hardy's dad. Um, we've had um, people who've just come back from sort of fringe show, you know, shows at the fringe, um, producers, screenwriters, that kind of thing, come in and give the students feedback on their work. So that is also another fantastic opportunity. And that is open um, to students across the university. So even if you uh, were not at Downing, you could still submit work um, and, and that's fine, but it's, it's also, it's additionally nice if you happen to be at Downing, you can be very involved in, in all of that as well. Thank you. There are also, of course, um, all sorts of anthologies, zines. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a really thriving scene at, at Cambridge with things like the Maze Anthology, um, which celebrates um, and supports student writing, creative writing. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, so we're not going to get to every question, but we'll do our best. Um, so does it put you at a disadvantage, disadvantage to mention a popular book such as The Handmaid's Tale in your personal statement as opposed to a far more niche, niche piece of literature? Sarah. No, it does not. <laughs> um, okay. The only thing I would say is that if it's a, if it's a really um, common A-level text, then um, it's likely that your um, admissions team will have read many personal statements about the same text. So it, it's more a case of text fatigue. Uh, I think there were a couple of years there where everybody seemed to have written on Dracula. And, um, you know, at a certain point, I was just thinking, I can't talk about Dracula anymore. Um, despite the fact that I actually teach the book and I like the book and, and all of that. So no, I mean, The Handmaid's Tale would be absolutely fine. We don't, we're not actually, despite our reputation, massive snobs. Um, and you know, who could be, who could be like that about Margaret Atwood anyway. So, um, you know, we've had, we've, we've had people talk about the Hunger Games. We've had people talk about, um, you know, Cornelia Funke, the Dragonheart series. There's really, I mean, you'd, you'd be amazed at the variety of texts people talk about in their personal statements. Um, 
and the, the, it, it's not the case that we're going to look at that and say, oh, you know, they should have chosen something much more niche and avant-garde. Um, but if you can give us a sort of sense of the range of texts that you're interested in, if you're if you're only writing about, if you if you say to us, I am only interested in 20th or 21st century dystopian young adult literature, and that is all I want to study. That's not going to be a good start because you're probably not going to want to do a course that makes you work through the medieval period and the Renaissance period and all of that sort of thing. So think about how your interests marry up with the course um, and make sure that your personal statement reflects the breadth of your interests. Yeah, definitely. And um, in regards to your personal statement as well, like it, it's a personal statement and so it should be about you. You shouldn't be putting a book in just because you think, oh, this is what they will want to hear about. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, um, you know, they are reading hundreds of applications um, every day. So um, making your personal statement as unique as possible um, without being strange um, is very, very good um, idea to do. <laughs> we do see some wacky ones. <laughs> um, we don't see a bit of eccentrism. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, last couple of Question. Oh, could I just add to that? I mean, don't think when, when we say mention text in your personal statement, don't think that we're only talking about, you know, primary literary texts. If you've read something, some sort of work of critical or cultural theory, or even something that you think of is quite removed, something sort of much more sociological, but it's blown your mind, please write about that. You know, don't feel like you have to write only about something that you think of as literary. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think, what, Sarah or Rosie, was there a question you saw that you um, definitely wanted to make sure that we answered at all? Um, so a, a few people have asked about the place of drama and theatre, and I think it is, it is really good to talk about um, your interest in theatre or things that you've studied within theatre studies within your personal statement, just because it opens up avenues for us to talk to you about your experience of performance, how you see the relationship between literature and performance and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a massive advantage. It's certainly not a disadvantage, but I would, I would put it in rather than leaving it out um, because it's part of who you are and how you engage with text. So it's, it's you know, part of your personal statement of, um, of your interest in the subject. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I just wanted to pick up on one other thing. Um, people have been asking about, you know, how, what is practical criticism and how does it work? Um, it, I mean, that's a sub, that's a, <laughs> we spend three years answering that question, so I can't answer it immediately, but I would, um, there are a couple of texts that I have mentioned um, in this, the answers to some of the other questions, which would be a good starting place for thinking about prep crit. Um, in addition, Terry Eagleton's How to, Leave, uh, How to Read a Poem uh, would probably be, be a good one um, to, to read as well. So I'd, I'd look at those and see how it's modelled in those texts as, as a kind of roundabout answer. Perfect, thank you. I think what we'll do is we'll end... Um, with this question, um, Rosie, what do you wish you knew in year 12? Um, I think probably I wish I knew or I wish I believed more that I had the potential because there was so much of the kind of inner turmoil of, you know, is it is it just completely ridiculous to submit an application? Am I wasting my time? Am I good enough? Um, and you've got, you've got no idea. As long as you're excited about having an academic English conversation and you want to be able to spark ideas off other people who share this, this interest, then go, then go for it. That's all you need. You don't need any profound knowledge of literature. And I think, I think that what's really important is that you just, you just need to have this desire and this capability to enter into a conversation about the subject that you love. Um, you, that's, that, that's enough to apply. And I wish I'd known that because I spent a lot of time kind of stressing about whether whether it was worth it, whether it was not, what I should do. Perfect, thank you. Sarah, have you got any final advice for the students? Uh, I think I've probably um, talked at great length, so I don't think so. But um, but yes, I'd, I'd echo Rosie that if you look at, at this course and you think this sounds exciting and you want this kind of challenge and intensity then please apply please don't let any you know phantasmal fears about about anything that you think Cambridge might be dissuade you because 
I would like to think you'd find us, you know, a whole lot friendlier and more exciting than, than often people fear. Perfect. Thank you both so much. Um, sorry we haven't got round to every single question. Um, if we haven't answered your question um, and you still like to know the answer, if you email me, you've all been receiving emails from me, um, and I'll make sure uh, that I either pass it to Rosie or Sarah or I can answer it myself. Um, I'll put my email in the um, chat as well to make sure that you have it. I'll do that before um, I close the webinar. Um, but I think all that's left to say is thank you to Rosie and Sarah um, for joining me and thank you all for joining us as well and we hope you found it a useful um, session.